Hi, welcome to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Today we're going to talk about the skin. The skin is the largest organ in the human body and can be subjected to a lot of stress, especially during this time of the year where radiation from the sun can cause some significant damage. There is also several types of diseases and skin cancers that can develop, and we're going to learn about all these conditions today. Our guest is Dr. Sarah Cannon. Dr. Cannon is a board-certified dermatologist, and she works at the Dermatology and Skin Care Center in Red Bank. Dr. Cannon, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So tell us about your background and how you got started in dermatology. Sure, sure. So I'm originally from Philadelphia, uh, and I uh, trained in uh, Jefferson and Philadelphia as well. Um, so I've been living over here in New Jersey for several years, but practicing at uh, Dermatology and Skin Cancer Center for the past three years or so. So great. it's been really great being so here. So why did you get so interested in dermatology during your medical career? What was so, the impetus there? Sure, sure. So in medical school, you know, getting to rotate through all of the different areas of medicine. Um, dermatology is just such a great field for being able to dive into multiple things. Procedures, work with your hands, um, have great patient contact and seeing multiple patients throughout the day and kind of learning about them. Um, and I just found the skin interesting. Awesome, yeah. You know, there's, especially during this time of the year with, uh, with the sun and the effects of the summer sun, how strong it is. We know that it can be very damaging for, and cause some skin cancer. So let's let's start off the show with some of the uh, skin cancers and what's involved in terms of the screening process and the diagnosis. Maybe kind of take us through. How do, you, how do you screen someone um, for skin cancer? Sure, sure. So that's a really a lot of what we do um, throughout the day, throughout the week when we're doing general dermatology and taking care of patients on a regular basis is skin cancer screenings. There is no set recommendation for the average person to have a yearly or six monthly or every two year skin exam. So we really base that on patient risk factors. When we see someone come in, um, we look at the amount of sun damage, their sun history, family history, things like that to help okay. us kind of guide um, how much we see them. So for skin cancer screenings, most people come to us without history of skin cancer. Um, and we basically check you from head to toe. We check your moles. We talk about sun protection measures to take throughout the summer months and throughout the year to protect the skin. Um, and if we detect things, we're able to take biopsies and treat them. So a typical skin exam, you would come into the office and we basically go from head to toe checking all areas of the skin, skin, hair, nails, um, and take care of any concerns that a person might have and if there are any concerning lesions that's where more might be done. Um, and okay. we see a lot of patients with skin cancer history in this area especially as well. So um, those people are seen a little bit more frequently. So the, in terms of the risk factors, is the history more important than like their skin type, like a fair skin or somebody that may have red hair and freckles or are those all equal risk factors? Or? So they're not necessarily equal. Um, it's, it can, there can be kind of a gray line there in terms of the different types of skin cancers and the risk factors that contribute to that. So basal cell and squamous cell are the most common types of skin cancer overall and they're the most common cancer overall okay. in general. So it accounts for uh, more than 5 million cases every year of cancer in general. Um, so that's the bulk of the type of skin cancers that we're seeing on a regular basis and they are fairly common mm -hmm. um, in our practice. So with basal cells and squamous cells we know that the biggest contributing factor is definitely UV radiation, the damage to the skin that's done over a person's lifetime. Okay. Um, but certainly family history, personal history of chronic cumulus sun exposure, blistering sunburns, um, a very moldy person or a lot of freckles. These are all things that need to be taken into account because they certainly add up in terms of risk factors for potentially developing another skin cancer in the future or being at risk for just developing the first skin cancer. Melanoma being the least common skin cancer but definitely the most deadly skin cancer mm -hmm. um, has UV radiation as one of the most common contributing factors to that, but has a lot of other factors that contribute as well. Family history, skin type, like you said, red hair, light skin, light eyes, um, having what we call atypical nevi or multiple moles that kind of have a, a funny appearance to them. Um, there are a lot of different things that can contribute to that pattern on a, on a person's skin, but we look at those things as well because that certainly puts someone in a different category of where we might think, yes, this person is at an increased risk for potentially developing melanoma over time. Okay, so you mentioned the, the basal cell and the squamous cell. Those are relatively benign usually, or they can turn 
to something else? Right, right. In most cases, so basal cells are very, very indolent, slow-growing skin cancer. So we really don't think about basal cells when caught early or even caught at in you know in between stages um, as being super aggressive tumors in terms of metastasis or spread throughout the body. Okay. However, a basal cell or a squamous cell left untreated can certainly grow locally, can invade, can cause a lot of tissue damage or morbidity uh, issues for the patient if left untreated. So when they are caught and and treated adequately, the cure rates are over 98 to 99 percent for okay. basal cells and squamous cells. So we don't think of them as, in most cases, deadly tumors. However, they can cause a lot of issues for patients mm -hmm. left untreated. Um, melanomas are the ones that, though they account for only about 1 percent, 1 to 2 percent of the skin cancer, um, they are the most deadly. And rates of melanoma continue to increase every single year. Okay. Yeah, so they're the ones that can turn, they can metathesize and spread to other organs and if exactly. not detected or treated. Right. So what's the, what's the diagnostic tools that you use to determine, obviously you're looking at it first, but then what do you do to determine the cell type? Sure. So there's, there's still nothing better than clinical examination. So the, the importance um, that we try to stress to our patients with skin exams is, coming to be seen for skin exams if you have those risk factors or a history of skin cancer, but home skin exams are extremely important because a lot of our patients come in and they're the one that has detected their mm -hmm. own skin cancer. Yeah. They notice a change or their wife or husband has, has told them that there's a black spot on your back that wasn't there. That's really, really important to be able to at least follow your own spots at home, not necessarily know the exact sizes or the mm -hmm. exact colors, but to notice a change, to be able to come in and tell us that something has you know, happened mm -hmm. in the time that we're not seeing them. Um, and in terms of diagnostic tools that we use outside of clinical examination, we use biopsies, we use dermoscopy, we use photography. Um, so biopsies are the objective way to get a piece of tissue, send it off for pathology review to look at underneath the microscope and determine the type of skin cancer. You can tell a lot from a biopsy. Um, you can tell the depth of a lesion, which is extremely important with melanoma. Um, you can also tell if there are certain other concerning factors about a tumor. Um, on biopsies, such as if they're around nerves or more aggressive features uh, to them. So, so you would important. need you would need that um, you you would need to do the biopsy to determine the the cell type, or you already know exactly. that based on exactly. Okay. There are a lot of clinical features that are very classic for a basal cell or squamous cell or melanoma. So you can oftentimes see them before you do a biopsy, um, but you want to have that biopsy determine the exact type of skin cancer, and then there are subtypes within those skin cancers that determine treatment and outcome as well. So it's, it's very important to have the biopsy. Is there a recommended, I know um, when you turn 50, you should have your first colonoscopy. Is there a recommended age that the Academy uh, says uh, people should be screened? Unfortunately not. No. Okay. Um, there hasn't been any consensus through them or um, the American Cancer Society, anybody yet to determine or give that right or perfect age, which Got is it. why um, you know we see a lot of children for baseline skin exams. We see a lot of adolescents or young adults for baseline skin exams. There is probably not a lot of high yield to doing skin exams on a young person on a yearly basis because their risk factors are still relatively low. Mm -hmm. But that's why we see people because we talk about risk factors, family history, other things that could determine how frequently they need to be seen. So. Most people that we see in our practice, or a lot of them, have history of precancerous or cancerous lesions. So that helps us to determine that we know we're going to be seeing them at least yearly, if not every six months, or even a little bit more frequently for higher risk skin cancers. Okay. Um, but then we also have regular people who have never had a skin cancer before, or but who tell me, you know, I went to tanning beds my whole life, mm. or I, I, I worked on a boat my whole life. So they have significant sun damage, which still adds risk factors to potential for them to have skin cancers in the future, and we will see them for yearly skin exams as well. Besides the sun, is there any other serious risk factors, uh, smoking, or anything else that would be a, a major contributor to skin cancer? Tanning care? bed use Tanning has bed. Okay. really come into the forefront as being a known carcinogenic factor for contributing to skin cancers. Um, a lot of studies that have come out over the past several years show that it increases your risk for all three of the most common skin cancers. Um, but the concerning thing is is melanoma, obviously, mm -hmm. because melanoma rates continue to go up. But the number of people dying from them is not changing, even though we're better at detecting melanoma. So right. um, the rates for young people, specifically melanomas, have doubled over the past 20 years wow. under the age of 45, and specifically in women, young women. Um, so we believe that this is directly attributable or 
a large proportion is, is coming from tanning bed use and, and high risk sun behaviors, tanning in regular sunlight, but also tanning in tanning beds. Mm -hmm. um, we really try to get that point out to people. I have a lot of patients who have come to me, um, and especially in this area being at the beach, that they've not only do regular tanning at the beach, but tanning beds, you know, before proms or, um, you know, before big events. And even just a, a few episodes of tanning bed use can significantly increase your risk for developing skin cancers in the future. Okay, so now you're diagnosed with a skin cancer, uh, hopefully not a melanoma. What's the treatment? these things? So it really varies based on skin cancer type or tumor type and then the subtypes within. So um, for basal cells and squamous cells, it really depends on location, the size of the tumor. Um, surgical procedures are very commonly used, um, either surgical excision where the tumor is taken out, all done under local anesthesia, and then the skin is, is closed, um, and that gives very high clearance rates. We also use a special skin cancer surgery called Mohs surgery, which is performed by um, specially fellows fellowship trained dermatologists who specialize in higher risk skin cancers, higher risk areas, um, more aggressive features of skin cancers. But then there are a lot of other methods that are non surgical, um, topical chemotherapeutics we use mm. to treat certain types of skin cancers, um, something called electrodesiccation and curatage, which is uh, scraping and burning of lesions. And then we also use liquid nitrogen and or cryotherapy and also a light treatment to treat more of the precancer side of lesions. So okay. um, surgical excision and surgical treatments are probably um, most commonly used, but again, it depends on the type of skin cancer and the location and the size. So when you talk about type and size, is there is there staging as well with skin cancers like other tumors in the body? So there is staging that is done for squamous cells more commonly and melanoma the most common. Um, that doesn't, it's not commonly used at least for basal cells and squamous cells for okay. the average tumor and for the average person. Melanoma, it is very important because that deals with prognosis, um, that deals with if any recommended extra treatments are needed, such as um, oncologist follow-up or further imaging. So with basal cells and squamous cells standardly, we don't um, stage them unless we find high risk factors um, on the size or on the biopsy, but melanoma, it's very important to stage because that really prognosticates how that person will do over a five year, or 10 year, or 15 year period. Got it. So now now we know what the treatment is. What's, what's the prevention for this? Obviously, you know, staying out of the sun where possible tanning beds are no, no. I know some of the teenage girls now are doing the spray tanning, which is much better, mm -hmm. obviously. Right. And so what is, what is uh, some of the really good prevention tips for the skin cancer? Sure. So from a sun protection standpoint, um, protecting from the sun is number one for any of the skin cancers. So sun avoidance is is the best mm -hmm. because you're not getting that UV radiation, but we know that people are going to be going out and we don't want to prevent people from living their lives and enjoying things. So um, when you're out, you know, there are a lot of sun protective clothing that is made that is, has what's a UPF level, um, which actually has a built-in block against sun. Oh, okay. um, so that helps wearing those protective types of clothing when you're going to be out in those midday hours. Um, sunscreen is extremely important and you want to be at a certain SPF when you're using sunscreen. So sunscreen at the minimum of 30 is really good and you'll get a little bit of incremental benefit as you go up in the SPF number. Um, not much above about a 50 or so, uh, but sunscreen is extremely important and using the right types of ingredients. So um, the average person will usually put sunscreen on, but they don't reapply or they don't put on enough. So mm -hmm. for sunscreen specifically, you should be using the way that it was tested to verify that that is the SPF level that someone will be getting is about a heaping shot glass is what someone should put on okay. every time they coat their body, which is not what most people will do. Mm -hmm. So if you keep a whole bottle of sunscreen for the summer, you definitely didn't use enough. You should be going through a little bit more than that. Um, so a, a heaping shot glass of sunscreen is really what should be meant for the whole body. Okay. Um, and we think about that general rule of those midday hours of trying to do sun avoidance or covering up and using a lot of sunscreen. So if your shadow is shorter than how tall you are, then you really are in those midday peak hours and you want to be doing all of those things for, for protection. Great. Okay, so we heard about uh, the various types of skin cancers and the prevention. When we come back, we're going to hear about some several different skin diseases and maybe some cosmetic uh, features as well that can be done in the dermatology field. Drop the baby. <laughs>
Welcome back to You and Your Health. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Our guest today is Dr. Sarah Cannon. Dr. Cannon is a board certified dermatologist and she practices at the Dermatology and Skin Care Center in Red Bank. Dr. Cannon, welcome back. So when we finished the first segment, we talked about several different skin cancers and you mentioned prevention. A uh, question we had during the break was, is there a difference between the aerosol um, skin um, lotions versus the regular kind of creamy lotion? Sure, sure. So in terms of active ingredients, um, which kind of becomes important at this point, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide are the two, the only two physical blockers or mineral sunblocks. Those are really the active ingredients that you want to be looking for in sunscreens. Um, and the difference with the aerosolized products is really usually they are the, more, the chemical sunscreens. Mm -hmm. um, so though you're going to still get the SPF that it has on the bottle, um, broad spectrum coverage is really best with physical blockers of the two, either zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. So I usually recommend my patients to stick with those act as the active ingredient. Brands are really not as important to me. Um, it's the active ingredient and the SPF number. So it's a minimum of a 30 and being zinc oxide and or titanium dioxide. And the importance of reapplying. Exactly. Reapplication should be at the minimum every two hours. But okay. if you're sweating, if you're working out, if you're swimming, it should go right back on. Great. Okay, let's talk about some of the other common skin disorders and treatment options. Um, teenage acne or, or adult acne is very common. Uh, what is acne and, and what do you do for it these days? Sure, sure. So acne is one of those conditions that is multifactorial. So there is nothing that you can see when a person comes in and say, you know, you have this one type of acne. Um, we can look at the type of outbreaks you have, the symptoms that are associated with it, um, and the types of pimples, things like that. But it is has multiple contributing factors. So um, there's bacterial buildup, there's clogged pores, there's the inflammatory response to all of that that's happening inside the pores, and then hormones become a big factor as well. So we take all of these things into account when we look at a person's skin, when we look at the types of flares and the types of breakouts that they actually get um, and symptoms over time if it flares with certain times of the month or certain times of the year things like that so you have to take all those things into account because medications are geared towards those mm -hmm. different okay. parts of acne and what is the, what is the most common I mean do you use antibacterials or what are, what are the medications that you use sure so in terms of topicals um, we use a lot of topical antibiotics and topical antibacterials and then also retinoids so retinoids are like retin-a type products they help with normalization of the way skin grows they help with declogging of pores acne scarring and things like that so they are really good as a basis for prevention and maintenance of any type of acne really. Um, and then topical antibiotics like benzoyl things like that, they really help with the inflammatory pimples, with bacterial buildup, with inflammation. Um, and then we also use oral antibiotics. Oral antibiotics are not a long-term solution for any acne patient okay. um, because of side effect profile that's associated with it. However, it can really, really help and be, make a big difference in the short term for calming down people who have very inflammatory uh, acne or a lot of bacterial buildup um, that okay. is associated with their type of acne. And what about things like moles and warts? Are they just, you know, common and you make sure they're nothing bad and you remove them or can there be something more associated with them? Sure. So moles are extremely common. We start to see them th for the majority of people developing young um, in, in children, adolescents. And we usually will stop seeing people developing new moles in late 20s, maybe mid 30s or so. You can certainly see moles changing over time, but there's no recommendation that if you have a mole and it appears benign on clinical examination and on history from the patient that there hasn't been any changes to it that has to be removed. That really doesn't change a person's skin cancer risk because the majority okay. of skin cancers will arise from normal skin anyway. So as long as moles on clinical examination um, appear benign and the history shows that they're not changing, they're not bleeding, they're not growing, we leave them alone and we just continue to monitor them. Okay. Uh, eczema. What is eczema and how do you how do you diagnose it and treat it? Sure. So eczema is a very uh, general term for dry, itchy, flaky skin. There's a lot of subheadings that come under eczema, but one of the most common is atopic dermatitis. So that is the itchy, rashy skin that you'll see most commonly presents in, in young children. Um, and that can be associated over time with a child developing asthma or allergic rhinitis or allergies. Um, we, we diagnose it based on the way that it looks, the pattern. Eczema or atopic dermatitis in children um, and young adults is very, very itchy. So we really think about that more as the itch that rashes. Um, so 
very sensitive skin, and a lot of what goes into eczema or atopic dermatitis, like acne, is very multifactorial. We know that atopic dermatitis children or patients have uh, a defect in the barrier in their skin, so they're able, their skin breaks down a lot easier. They take on a lot more allergens, so they're sensitive to many other things that mm -hmm. the average skin wouldn't be. Um, they have an increased risk for getting infections there, and they're very, very itchy. So we try to manage all of those symptoms, and oftentimes you end up using um, topical steroids, topical anti-inflammatories to calm the skin down, sometimes uh, antibiotics to controlling infections that might com come on top of that because people are very, very itchy with that condition. So um, that's how we treat that. Okay, psoriasis, what is what is that? So psoriasis too, um, as you can see a pattern with a lot of skin diseases in dermatology is multifactorial as well. Um, psoriasis is a big genetic component to it. Um, we see it in young children definitely, but there is a peak in around the 20s to 30s and then also a peak around the 50s for people. So those are kind of when we're seeing waves of new cases of psoriasis. So psoriasis, like eczema, um, is not, ne something, not necessarily something that you cure. It can get better over time and we control it. It's a really exciting and great time for psoriasis um, if you do have psoriasis because there are a lot of new medications that have hit the market recently. So um, classically, it has been topical steroids, topical anti-inflammatories, we use light treatment as well, um, but there are a lot of new injectable medications which are in the mm. immunosuppressant family of medications, and they've really researched and figured out the pathways that lead to psoriasis and have been able to really target the, the mechanisms behind it. Um, so a lot of the new medications that are out on the market now are injectable medications, and they really have great clearance rates for psoriasis for control over great. time. Now, if somebody just has you know dry skin, I mean, and they treated with uh, some topical uh, moisturizer, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a there's a medical problem right. there, correct? Right. Right. When is it when does it become something that is needs to be assessed and diagnosed as something further? Sure. Um, in, in terms of good dry skin care, you know, we want everyone to be moisturizing and if the skin is breaking down, we do a lot of dry skin care techniques um, such as not taking super hot showers, um, using emollients like ointments are better than creams, which are better than lotions. Um, and when the skin doesn't respond to good things like that at home, then that's when we really want to step in because you don't want the skin to be constantly mm -hmm. breaking down. You have risk for more infections, for thickening of the skin, and for uh, more longevity of the lesion. Mm -hmm. So really when you're not responding to typical things like that at home, just taking good good care of your skin and moisturizing, um, and there's plaques that are just always present, those are times when we can help. Okay. Um, and that's when you can use more prescription strength, stronger topical medications to help control um, those outbreaks. And oftentimes for people, it does resolve over time. It might be an allergen to something that they're coming in contact with in their skin, or maybe they're taking very hot showers and using a lot of irritating products. And these are all things that we can go through with patients to help target what exactly might be causing it. Sometimes it's just a genetic disease, but sometimes it's external factors too. Got it. Now a lot of people don't think of the hair as something uh, associated with the skin. So hair loss, is that something you deal with in dermatology? And what, what are some of the options these days for hair loss? Sure, sure. So we deal a lot with that. That is probably one of the most concerning um, diseases that people come in for because it's it, it's very scary for people when they start to see hair loss. So when, with that, you have to really do a good assessment of the hair loss that the person is experiencing. Is it is it bald patches? Is it scarring? Is it just thinning of the hair? Is it a lot of loss? So that helps us to kind of divide out um, the type of hair loss that it could potentially be, scarring or non-scarring. And then with non-scarring hair loss, there are a lot of different um, hair diseases. Some of them are autoimmune in nature. Some of them are related to genetics or hormonal imbalances, sometimes even underlying medical conditions like an und undiagnosed thyroid disease or anemia or low blood count. Um, so we take all of those factors into account. We assess the hair, sometimes biopsies are needed to actually look at the hair follicles and the hair itself. Um, and that really helps to guide us in terms of which direction we can go and which direction we can treat. One of the most common things we see is, is androgenetic alopecia, genetic or age-related hair loss that sometimes is related to hormonal imbalance. Um, and we use topicals such as Rogaine or Minoxidil. We use oral medications that help to deal with hormonal imbalances that could be contributing to that. And there are some new procedures that are out now, something called PRP, um, which uses a patient's own plasma to help stimulate growth and give growth factors back to the scalp. So those are that's one of the newer and up-and-coming treatments that 
has had some good benefit in combination with other treatments for at least one of the most common types of hair loss. That's interesting. So you use, I mean, in PRP, in the sports medicine orthopedic world, uh, you know, I know of, but you, you're using it for hair yes. follicles as yes. well, to stimulate hair follicles? Right. So okay. would you do that in patches or you do it in... Uh, large areas? Or? You can. You can yeah. do it in large areas. Wow. And for um, female pattern hair loss or male pattern ha hair loss, oftentimes um, people are coming in and they're just starting to notice it and they're trying to want to be on top of things before it progresses. So um, you're targeting certain areas that are losing the most. Oftentimes for androgenic alopecia or these female pattern or male pattern hair losses, the hair stays very thick at the at the back of the head mm -hmm. um, for a long time. So you're able to target certain areas. It's done over a series of treatments um, mm -hmm. and it takes multiple times, um, but you can definitely see improvement over time with the injections. Now you mentioned the Rogaine's or Minoxidil. Mm -hmm. Are there any side effects of those products and, and are they just topically applied or is it oral? How, how is the Right, the so applied? Minoxidil has been around for a very long time. It's topically applied um, and the solutions now are all, are all the same percentage for both for men and women and we have people use them on a daily basis um, and what goes into minoxidil treatment is that oftentimes you're going to see a loss of hair in the beginning because it really recycles the way that the hair is growing so sometimes people get discouraged at that time period because they think it's not working or it's worsening things and we tell people to really push through with that side effects that you can see with minoxidil are occasionally local irritation to where you're applying the product um, but we are definitely Want, want to tell patients that when they're using that medication, especially for women, that you have to just be careful where you're applying it because it's stimulating hair growth. Mm. You don't want to be putting it at other locations on the face. Um, but it's a very well tolerated medication. It just takes a long time, just like the, the cycle of a hair and growth of a hair takes a long time. You have to stick with it. I usually have patients at the minimum use it for 8 to 12 months before we say that it's a potential failure. Okay. Now, there's some exciting new cosmetic procedures that you can do these days for, for various conditions. Um, uh, Botox is, is very common. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain the process of Botox and, and where, would, where do people typically use that? Sure. So Botox is most commonly used for upper face uh, dynamic movement lines. So lines that happen with facial expression, not necessarily at rest, but that happen when a person moves their face and moves the upper muscles of the face. So Botox is used for uh, paralysis of muscles. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds a little bit yeah. you know, crazy <laughs> at first, um, but in targeted doses to correct muscle uh, muscles and, and, and in specific locations, you're able to knock out movement or at least decrease or blunt movement in certain locations to help with lines, fine lines and wrinkles that happen with movement. So forehead, in between the eyes, what we call the gobella, and around the eyes are probably the most common locations that we use Botox to help smooth fine lines and wrinkles. Um, and we also have generalized that we use it in a lot of other locations on the face for very specific muscle movement, um, sometimes for lines around the mouth or certain locations um, to the sides of the mouth as well for certain lines there. Um, so it really depends on what bothers a person. So when we see them, we assess them, and it's a series of injections of very small needles that are used to deposit the product into those areas. And it works very well. It can last for up to six months for many people. Great. I know there's one new product out, uh, Kybella, it's used for the kind of that puffy chin look. Right. Uh, and, and can you just explain that? Sure. So process? Kybella deoxycholic acid, it's a, it's a bile acid. Um, and what it does is it ac actually degrades fat um, oh. and to a, a semi-permanent and permanent degree. Um, so it's only indicated for submental fat. So that thickening, that many people hate underneath their neck. Um, <laughs> the which double can, chin Exactly, look, yeah. exactly, which can be, um, you know, over time weight related or even genetic related. Some people just have a fullness underneath their chin that, you know, they do everything they can to work out and to eat right and exercise and they just can't seem to get rid of that. Um, so Kybella is, is a great product for that area. So it again is a series of injections where you inject the, the Kybella molecule into this area and it slowly over time will degrade the fat. The, the injections are done on about a monthly basis or so. And what you find after a series of injections is that you slowly start to lose the amount of fat that's there. Your angle underneath your neck becomes a little bit more, um, you know, acute and tighter, mm -hmm. and Great. it really helps with, with that area. Awesome. Dr. Cannon, thanks for joining us on the show. Really appreciate okay. Thank it. Thank you so much for having me. So you've been listening to You and Your Health, where we talked about um, dermatology and various different skin types. I'm your host, Dr. David Bertone. Until next time, we'll see you on You and Your Health. Mm -hmm.